Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the next iteration of Live with the Hagley Historian. Since Hagley Museum and Library is still closed to the public and staff, we are bringing Hagley to you. This is part of our Hagley from Home initiative. I'm coming to you live from my home here in Wilmington, Delaware. You can see my two production assistants here in the background, Lucian and Elliot, hard at work. So if anything happens, they hear anything uh, that they think is uh, not in uh, keeping up with the fine traditions of the United States Navy, I'm sure that they're probably going to uh, stand up and tap me on the shoulder or run around or do something hilarious in the background. So be aware that uh, they're here. Hope you all enjoy their presence as well. So today's topic about Samuel Francis DuPont in the Civil War Navy is one that is near and dear my heart for a lot of reasons. Uh, those of you who know me out and about in the world know that I do enjoy the history of the United States Navy. In addition to my work at Hagley Museum and Library, I'm also an active volunteer with historic ships at the Independent Seaport Museum in Philadelphia, particularly with the cruiser Olympia. So I like to get into the history of the Navy, and a lot of what we'll talk about today with Samuel Francis DuPont plays directly into later what will happen with the U.S. Navy. Then uh, that can be a topic for another time, but it all plays in at the mid-19th century Navy playing into the early 20th century Navy. So let's get into Samuel Francis DuPont and the Civil War Navy without further ado. I came to this topic, like many of the ones I've talked with you about, by uh, doing the Civil War exhibition for Hagley back in 2011, that uh, this was another topic which I found there was a lot yet to be said on, even though there's been several books written about Admiral DuPont and about the Navy during that period. But I'm going to take you on a bit of a, a different type of a journey today. We're going to start with a monument. This one, the Samuel Francis DuPont statue, which is in Rockford Park here in Wilmington, Delaware. If you've ever traveled around Wilmington, you've probably seen this monument at some point. It's uh, not that far from Hagley. It's, it's practically on the Brandywine River, uh, not far from where Admiral DuPont actually lived. Part of my process in thinking about all this was starting with this monument. You know, what's this monument all about? How did it end up in Rockford Park of all places? So today I'm going to take you on a journey out and back again, if you will, starting with the monument, and we'll bring our way back to it. But to uh, understand why this monument is here and what it's all about, we have to get into Samuel Francis DuPont and his Civil War Navy service. Samuel Francis DuPont was born on September 27, 1803 in Bergen Point, New Jersey, and moved with his family to the banks of, banks of the Brandywine here in Wilmington, not far from where the original DuPont Powder Works were located. His parents are Victor Marie DuPont and Gabrielle de Lafitte de Pelleport DuPont. Victor DuPont was the older brother of E. I. DuPont, who started the DuPont Company, and uh, both were sons of P.S. DuPont de Namur, who we spoke about a few weeks ago at length, about getting into why the DuPont family came to the United States. So Samuel Francis DuPont was born in the United States, the son of Victor and Gabrielle DuPont. His career with the Navy started pretty early. He was appointed a midshipman in 1815 and first went to sea in 1817. The painting you're seeing is of Samuel Francis DuPont in his midshipman's uniform. And you'll no doubt notice he was born in 1803 and was appointed a midshipman in 1815. He was a pretty young guy in that period, to uh, you would think, to uh, be part of the Navy. He started early, yes. And that's how you became an officer in the Navy before the U.S. Navy Academy, which didn't come into being until the 1840s. You started off young. You took a few years of classes learning things like the theory behind navigation, seamanship, gunnery, those sorts of things. Then you go to sea and you learn on the job. It's, it's a practical apprenticeship, if you will, for Navy officers. And that's how Samuel Francis DuPont came to be in the Navy, that, that he got appointed as a midshipman. He was given a choice between being a midshipman in the Navy or going to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He chose going into the Navy. So he started off pretty early and took cruises into the Mediterranean, all over the North and South Atlantic, that he was a pretty well-traveled guy by the time he was in his 20s. So uh, he um, saw a lot of the world during his lifetime. But getting us to him and his Civil War service, an important step in this process is his service in the Mexican-American War in 1846 to 48. 
And the image you're seeing here is a uh, image of him as a uh, commander in the Navy. So this is a couple of years down the road, a few steps up in promotion for him. And this is a pretty important thing, again, for Samuel Francis DuPont, because it gives him his first real combat service in independent command. But it also gave him practical experience in blockades, that his main job during the Mexican-American War was to blockade the Baja of California, which you see just to the left, and then the Gulf of California, which is off the little spit of land you see there. He had to make sure that no Mexican ships came and went, but an important part of conducting a blockade during that era was to make sure that you followed proper international protocols for a blockade, that it's not just making sure enemy ships don't come and go, it's protecting the rights of neutrals, protecting the rights of all the other countries involved, dealing with foreign navies, so he had to deal with the French Navy, the British Navy, a lot of people who were involved in the world during that time that uh, weren't necessarily directly involved in the war, but that's part of what you have to think about in dealing with this. He also got his first experience in amphibious actions and taking the soldiers under the command of uh, Union or U.S. Uh, General uh, John C. Fremont, not yet a general at that point, to uh, uh, make attacks in California. So uh, he worked on joint operations. He also did this in the Gulf of California, making raids, leading Navy infantry landing parties on raids into the Baja of California to uh, capture a couple of forts, ships, and other things. So he saw a lot of combat service, and this is pretty important for him, again, because it gives him a lot of practical experience in not only conducting military operations, but dealing with international diplomacy. A next major step along the way for Samuel Francis DuPont to get into the Civil War was uh, being appointed command of the USS Minnesota and taking it on a trip to China in 1857 to 59. So this was considered a pretty important honor for him, and this is, you're, you're getting later on into his career. Remember, he was first appointed in 1815, so by 1817, he had, or by 1857, he had been in the Navy for quite a while, had achieved the rank of captain by this point. So he's pretty well up in the ranks. This was considered an important mission because he not only was taking the USS Minnesota, which was one of the most powerful frigates the United States had made up to that point, but uh, also carried the U.S. minister to China, to China, to carry out diplomatic relations. So he had a pretty important job dealing with diplomacy. He also got to witness the Anglo-French bombardment of the Chinese Taku forts during the Second Opium War, and uh, witnessed this on May 20th, 1858. So he's not only taking the U.S. envoy to China, to India, after being in China, but also witnessing large-scale naval operations, watching large-scale naval bombardments of heavily fortified areas in China, but then watching how the French and the British navies work together to carry out this operation. This is yet another example of how he dealt with international diplomacy, not just with dealing with the American minister, but also in him learning about how the Royal, by better, getting a better idea how the Royal Navy did what they did, the French Navy, how they did what they did, how they, they conduct operations, getting to know a lot of people, watching how they blockaded China, and dealing with a large-scale operation on, on their end, so got to be an observer. He didn't see this from the deck of the USS Wabash. It wouldn't make it up to where the Taku forts were located, so he ended up taking an American gunboat up and watching a lot of this from an American gunboat and then also from a, a British frigate. So a pretty important thing for him to, to witness all of this. Another step in the process for Samuel Francis DuPont was he had the honor of hosting the first Japanese mission to the United States in May through July of 1860. He got this job because he was one of the more senior officers in the U.S. Navy by 1860, was considered one of the most well-read, well-traveled, learned officers, and also one of the most experienced in diplomacy. So building on what we've been talking about. So he got to conduct the operations in Mexico, got to uh, take the envoy to China, the American envoy to China, and watch how the British and the French did what they did. So his job with the Japanese mission was to practice that diplomacy and then also make sure that they got to where they needed to go at the correct times and had a good time while they were in the U.S. The image that you're seeing on your screen is of the 
Japanese mission with the American naval officers that took them around at the Washington Navy Yard in 1860. And Samuel Francis DuPont is the tall guy in the center with the top hat. So he was a front and center in a lot of ways for this pretty important diplomatic mission. When we get to the eve of the American Civil War, Samuel Francis DuPont was on the verge of retirement from the United States Navy. He received the appointment to a commandant of the Philadelphia Navy Yard in December 1860, pretty much uh, in, in, right in his backyard, so to speak, from Wilmington, Delaware, where he hoped to retire. He had a home here with his wife, Sophie, uh, just across from the DuPont Powder Yards. And so he thought, this is going to be a great gig. I'm going to do short duty for the rest of my career. I'm going to manage a Navy Yard. Easy peasy. That's uh, what you did in the Navy during that period. Your last appointments were to Navy Yard shore installations, and then that worked your way up to your retirement. But uh, the American Civil War thwarted those plans. Notice he was appointed in December 1860. That's also when the state of South Carolina seceded from the Union, and the Civil War got rolling not long after in April of 1861. So he got immediately pulled into large-scale military planning. General Winfield Scott grabbed Samuel Francis DuPont immediately to be on the blockade board, so which he served from June to September of 1861, helping coming up with the uh, so-called Anaconda Plan, like a big anaconda snake strangling out the Confederacy. His job was to come up with naval strategy, to help devise naval strategy for the Anaconda Plan. And remembering that he was a well-traveled, well-read, considered one of the most respected officers in the U.S. Navy because of all of his prior service. And that's why he had the honor of being able to help come up with a large-scale strategy. So Winfield Scott led the overall effort, and Army generals came up with a plan for how it was going to work on land, but Samuel Francis DuPont came up with how it was going to work by sea. So his strategy for this was to break up the Confederate coast into four sectors. The first was called the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Their jurisdiction was from the border of North and South Carolina up through the Chesapeake Bay. And this was considered a pretty important place because the Chesapeake Bay, you've got Fortress Monroe, Norfolk, Virginia, also the entrance to waters that take you all the way to Washington, D.C., and even uh, indirectly to the Confederate capital at Richmond. So this was a, a pretty important sector, and that's part of why that's so small. The next sector was the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, the jurisdiction on the border from North and South Carolina to the southern tip of Florida. And this included Charleston, South Carolina, Savannah, Georgia, in Fernandina, Florida, which at that point was considered a pretty major port, that this was a, a way to get supplies and things inland into the uh, east coast, the deep south on the east coast. So uh, this was considered another important part of the blockade. You have the East Gulf Blockading Squadron, which was from the southern tip of Florida to New Orleans, and then the West Gulf Blockading Squadron, which was from New Orleans to the border between Texas and Mexico. And you also have the river squadrons, which work in the Mississippi River, and to cooperate with uh, inland operations, particularly with General U.S. Grant in 1861-1862. So there's a lot of naval operations going on, and, and this has to do with Samuel Francis DuPont. He's the one, again, helping come up with this, leading the charge for the U.S. Navy in coming up with this. So after the blockade board's work is done, he was appointed commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron in September 1861. So remember, this is a pretty important duty that the Charleston, never forget, is a, a big target for the U.S. military because not only is it a major port, but it's where the secession movement really got rolling in a public way. So there's a big political point to be scored to capture Charleston. So he has to devise a strategy for the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. He is given the USS Wabash. Notice that it looks remarkably similar to the USS Minnesota, and that's because these were both sister ships. The Wabash and the Minnesota were both steam frigates made at the same time. So he's already familiar with a ship like this and how it works, and it was one of the most powerful in the U.S. Navy's arsenal at the time. So the USS Wabash and all the other boats he could put together ships he could put together to be able to go and effectively blockade the southern coast, but then also uh, carry out operations. One of his first considerations is where do we go first? And so he chose Port Royal in South Carolina. 
And there's a, a, a couple of good reasons for doing this, that Port Royal is a deep water port, so you can get heavy ships in and out of Port Royal. It's also just below Charleston, South Carolina, just north of Savannah, so you're pretty well between two major areas in which you want to operate, two major cities and ports which you want to attack. But then also it's a place midway between Philadelphia and the southern tip of Florida. So why think about that? A major consideration for the U.S. Navy is that you've got to have a place to store coal because these are coal-burning ships to a large extent. They are sail ships backed up with steam, or a lot of them are solely steam power. But with steam power, you have to think about things like machine shops, dry docking. So since the, the Navy Yard at Norfolk had been captured by Confederate forces, you can't get really anything into the D.C. Navy Yard. The closest major Navy Yard for the U.S. Navy was Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, or even Brooklyn, New York. So that's a long way to go. One of the ideas with taking Port Royal is you can set up floating dry docks, you can set up machine shops, you can have a coaling station there. So it can be a base of operations for doing repairs, uh, not as heavy as you can do in Philadelphia, but you can do a lot of your repairs on station so that you don't have to take ships out of action. But then also ships that are coming out of the Gulf blockading squadrons can stop off there, recoal, get service work done before going on if they need to go on. So that's the idea for taking Port Royal. He got together a flotilla. He wanted to originally do this as a joint operation between the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. But on his way down to Port Royal in October of 1861, a hurricane dispersed his flotilla. So he got there. A lot of the Navy ships got there. Some of the transports were sunk. The U.S. Marine Corps' transports were sunk, so they lost all of their equipment, although they lost no people. Uh, so he had a big decision to make whenever... They were, he was gathering his ships there in early November. Do we attack now, whenever we've got an open weather window, although our, all of our forces aren't here, or do we wait? Samuel Francis DuPont made the decision to go ahead and attack because he wanted to not miss an opportunity. They had good weather in early November. So on November 7th, he committed all of the Navy forces to making a concentrated attack at Port Royal, South Carolina, bombarding two Confederate forts, Forts, uh, forts uh, Walker and Beauregard, which were on opposite ends of the entrance to <clears throat> Port Royal. So notice in the uh, image there, there's ships in the center sailing in a big circle, and then there's a bunch of ships kind of sitting off toward the bottom. The ones that are sailing in a circle are the U.S. Navy ships that went in for the attack, and the ones at the bottom were the uh, Army transports, other ships that were gathering. Again, because they weren't all there, uh, he, he couldn't commit all of his forces, so a lot of the Army uh, soldiers had to watch this battle from the decks of their ships. This was a calculated risk on Samuel Francis DuPont's part. The idea in sailing in a big circle is that as they traveled around, as the guns of their ships came to bear on the forts, they would fire full broadsides. And so much to a lot of people's surprise, this battle was an absolute stunning success that there were as a complete rout of the secessionist forces at Forts Walker and Beauregard. So the United States Navy alone took Port Royal, South Carolina. And the uh, image you're seeing is from Harper's Weekly. This is showing you Confederates running, getting the heck out of Dodge, so to speak, to get away from the bombardment of the Navy ships. After the Navy felt that they had bombarded the forts long enough, they sent a Navy infantry force ashore to actually physically take the forts. The Navy infantry are the ones who took Forts Walker and Beauregard in South Carolina. So part of the calculated risk Samuel Francis DuPont made here was he knew full well how hard it would be for ships and the Navy alone to take entrenched positions. But a lot of his intelligence had told him that uh, the Confederates hadn't been there long they hadn't had time to learn their guns, they hadn't had proper time to aim the guns, that he could go in and, and do this and, and have a higher risk of success than if they had been there for a long time. And so this is an idea to hold on to, you know, that he knew that the, the heavy guns in these forts, you know, even though they had a smaller number of guns, could in a lot of ways get parity with the Navy ships. Uh, but one of the pieces of intelligence that he had which made him decide to attack on November 7th was that the Confederates had only been in these forts less than 24 hours, so they hadn't even had time really to get to know anything in these forts. So it was a, a complete hit them by surprise kind of an operation and, and was, again, a stunning success for the United States Navy.
and it was the first Union victory of the American Civil War. This is an incredibly important thing because up to November 1861, the Union had lost a lot of battles, uh, small battles in West Virginia, larger battles in Virginia, and other places that, that the Union forces were not faring well. So the first major victory, or the first Union victory of the American Civil War was done by the U.S. Navy. So they're pretty happy about this. The Navy is. It's a big prestige thing for the Navy. And so there's a lot of commemoration that comes out of this, a lot of immediate uh, celebration. The images that you're seeing is uh, the, the one at bottom is a cover from the Battle of Port Royal sheet music con uh, composed by a guy named Charles Grobe of Wilmington, Delaware. And uh, what you're seeing at right is the first page of uh, the Battle of Port Royal music. This was uh, written for pianoforte. And I noticed that it shows Samuel Francis DuPont's ships boldly going into battle with the USS Wabash out front. And it even gives you a little map of the battle in the bottom corner. Now, this is not the most stunning piece of music ever composed. That uh, We uh, had someone actually play this and made a recording of it for the Civil War exhibition in 2011. I'll have to see if I can dig the recording out for uh, those of you who are interested. Uh, but the important part is that it's part of the celebration of Union forces, that they were everyone is so happy that this happened because, the, again, the Union forces had suffered such terrible defeats up to that point. And also Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick and other maritime literary classics, uh, took up the idea of the Battle of Port Royal in a piece of prose. So in 1862, he uh, put together a poem called DuPont's Round Fight, which is supposed to be a double entendre, double meaning uh, that there was a round fight and the ships sailed in a circle, so it was literally a round fight, but also a round fight in that the Union forces roundly defeated the secessionists at Port Royal. So uh, this is not the most sparkling piece of prose that Herman Melville ever wrote. Again, the important part of this is that literary masters like Melville were taking on this as a idea, that they were thinking about this, that they're commemorating this, that it was such a big deal that it captured everyone's attention. So it also gained Samuel Francis DuPont an official vote of thanks from the United States Congress, which he appreciated, but the thing that he said he appreciated the most out of the Battle of Port Royal was this commemorative sword, which he was presented in May of 1862. And why he liked it so much is that it was paid for by a collection of friends and neighbors in Wilmington, Delaware, that even people who worked at the DuPont Powder Works contributed 25 cents each to pay for this. And part of the idea of, of paying for the sword is that no one person could contribute any more than a dollar. Uh, so if you look in the pay books for the DuPont company, you'll see where practically all of the employees at DuPont kicked in 25 cents to uh, help pay for the sword. That it's uh, pretty ornate. It comes with two scabbards, uh, one that's uh, fancy and gold engraved, one that uh, he could carry on the ship. It's in this nice presentation box. Lovely, lovely piece, and it came with absolutely everything you needed to carry and use this sword. And he said that this was one of the things he was most proud of in receiving to commemorate him winning the Battle of Port Royal in November of 1861. Another interesting thing that happens on Samuel Francis DuPont's watch is interactions with the ex-slave Robert Smalls and the steamer Planter. So this ends up being a pretty interesting story that Robert Smalls was a crew member on this boat, the steamer Planter, which was the uh, personal dispatch and transport boat for Confederate General Roswell Ripley in the uh, Port of Charleston, South Carolina, that uh, this boat had a uh, white officers and an enslaved crew. So Robert Smalls was the pilot, one of the lead people. And apparently he looked a lot like the captain of the boat. He came up with a plan that one night whenever all the white officers went ashore against their orders, that he was going to break open the commanding officer's sea chest, put on his clothing, get the crew together, and just sail right out to the South Atlantic blockading squadron. Uh, which is exactly what he did, that uh, nobody thought anything about the steamer planter going about Charleston Harbor because it was always going about Charleston. Nobody thought anything about a black crew being aboard because the entire crew were slaves except for the officers. And uh, Robert Smalls knew the proper signals, knew the right things to say, and also he picked a day where the steamer planter was scheduled to carry ordnance to Fort Sumter, so nobody thought another thing about it. On the appointed night, he put on the clothes. They sailed over to a a dock close by where the planter was docked, picked up everyone's families, 
and they sailed directly out to the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. When the uh, first ship to encounter it, the USS Onward, saw a planner coming, they didn't know what was going on. They cleared for action and got ready, and then said they were stunned to see an all-black group of people dancing around on deck. And when they figured out what happened, that this was Roswell Ripley's boat and that slaves had stolen it, they immediately dispatched the boat to Port Royal to see Samuel Francis DuPont. That Samuel Francis DuPont thought this was a pretty stunning story. He was in the middle of writing a letter to his wife Sophie and uh, wrote something to the effect of, hang on a minute, something amazing has happened, and then the next sentence starts in with the story of how Robert Small stole this boat. The tintype that you see at right is Samuel Francis DuPont's personal tintype of Robert Smalls, which is a pretty amazing thing to have in our collections at Hagley. But Robert Smalls ends up becoming a pretty important figure that he helps uh, get into, he, he helps lead the charge in a lot of ways with uh, showing people high up in the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron what valuable intelligence ex-slaves can give, but then uh, also uh, works his way up to being the uh, uh, a, a captain of the planter later on that uh, it ended up being bought by the Army and used as a transport boat, so he became the, the captain of that boat and served the rest of the war as captain himself of the steamer planter. But to the idea of contrabands. So the idea of contrabands is they're an escaped slave. They were considered property at this point, not until the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution were slaves considered people. Up to that point, legally, they were property. So they were contraband of war, and the government could legally confiscate them under a couple of confiscation acts. They become an important part of U.S. Navy strategy on the South Atlantic coast, and for Samuel Francis DuPont, too, because these guys become a wonderful source of intelligence, and they also solve a manpower problem in the U.S. Navy, that uh, one of the problems the Navy faced was not having enough people, not having enough ships. So what do we do with that? Although there were laws on the books that prohibited black men from joining the Army, they were not to prohibit them from joining the U.S. Navy. So uh, Samuel Francis DuPont, the U.S. Navy, had no problem bringing in these escaped slaves putting them as crews of U.S. Navy ships, you know, that these guys were experienced seamen. They knew what they were doing. They knew the land, so they could help navigate ships in some of the inland waters around South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. They became a very valuable part of U.S. Navy operations in the southeast. And this also helped Samuel Francis DuPont change his mind on the whole issue of slavery that he wrote in many occasions that uh, he had defended it as a constitutional issue, not a moral one, until he actually saw it in action, and his quote was that a hog in Massachusetts has it better than a slave in South Carolina, that after having seen slavery firsthand, he became a, a pretty uh, staunch uh, opponent of slavery in any form, and was more than happy to use these escaped slaves in the U.S. Navy because he found them smart, intelligent people that knew what they were doing, and carried on a correspondence with Robert Smalls throughout the end of the American Civil War. So this is a pretty important part of Samuel Francis DuPont's U.S. Navy service because not only is it exposing him to these new people, but he changes his mind about the issue of slavery and in turn helps advocate with a lot of other members of his family to become opponents of slavery wherever they are. Samuel Francis DuPont also has the distinction of being one of the first people in the U.S. Navy to be promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral, which uh, he was promoted to on July 30th, 1862. This is pretty important because up to that point, the U.S. Navy did not have the rank of Rear Admiral. The Navy had tried to not be like the British, the French, European navies. They didn't want the associations with the Admiralty with that kind of uh, royal, regal, uh, inherited type of, of uh, command structure in the Navy, but they realized organizationally that wasn't going to work during the American Civil War, the way the Navy handled rank up to that point is the highest rank you could achieve was captain. And above that, you could be appointed a commodore, which was an honorific if you were appointed to uh, command a squadron, a flotilla, a group of ships, a Navy yard, you could be called a commodore, and then whenever your command was done, your permanent rank was captain. So that doesn't really work because in the Army, you have different grades of general, and one of the problems they had was in working with the Army when joint operations you didn't have an equal rank structure, so they created the grade of rear admiral, which was on par with a, an army major general. The commodore was equivalent to a brigadier general, and then rear admiral at that point, which was the only rank. Later, the uh, Navy created the full admiral during the Civil War. 
uh, to organizationally structure all this. But then also because of the sheer volume of ships that were involved, you needed a more sophisticated rank structure. But Samuel Francis DuPont's one of the first people to receive the rank of Rear Admiral in 1862, and he absolutely loved this, thought it was a fantastic thing to get to be one of the first people to be an admiral. And the uniform you're seeing in the photograph shows the very first iteration of the Rear Admiral's uniform. So all the, uh, the, the uh, lace on the cuff, the shoulder boards, that's the, the first rank structure for a U.S. Navy Rear Admiral. It's pretty fascinating stuff if you're into the material culture of the period, and this is another piece which is in our collections at Hagley. The less exciting part of his duties, but one of the most important bits, was settling into the blockade. The image you see is of Samuel Francis DuPont. He's at top, kind of uh, to the uh, right center with his arm out on the sail. This is them standing around a, a Dahlgren gun on the uh, deck of the USS Wabash. But uh, settling into the blockade was not considered very glorious or glamorous duty, but this is one of the main things which he had to do. And remember, all the experience that he had had before, both conducting blockades and carrying out blockades, that uh, he pretty well, to his and the Navy Department's satisfaction, sealed up the major ports, which he was responsible for sealing up, that by late 1862, the port of Fernandina, Florida, had been captured, the uh, uh, port of Savannah, Georgia, had been captured, and Fort Pulaski, which guarded it. The only open port in his jurisdiction was Charleston, South Carolina and he felt that he had that pretty well blockaded and was able to, to pretty well keep blockade runners from coming in from Bermuda and the Bahamas toward his sector of the, the blockading squadron. But this was not glamorous duty. It was a lot of guys standing on ships in fair and foul weather, sailing back and forth, always on the lookout for something happening. That it was, uh, again, terrible, terrible duty for the people that were doing it, but one of the most important for the U.S. Navy to carry out during this period. And he, Samuel Francis DuPont, and a lot of the people who were his junior commanders caught a lot of flack for this because there were varying reports in Congress that the blockade was ineffective. The Confederates always tried to claim that the blockade was ineffective. So there's constant arguments back and forth with everyone involved as to how effective the U.S. Navy's blockade is. But uh, by all accounts, it was an effective blockade despite all of the boredom and tedium of being a part of it. One of the game changers that happens on Samuel Francis DuPont's watch was the famous Battle of Hampton Roads between the USS Monitor and the Confederate ironclad Virginia on March 8th and 9th, 1862. The uh, battle itself is uh, where the CSS Virginia, formerly the USS Merrimack, steamed out in the Hampton Roads in Virginia near Norfolk and started making a raid on U.S. Navy ships. And the USS Monitor came just in the nick of time and fought to a stalemate. So uh, neither won, but important thing here is the proof of concept, that ironclads could be a serious offensive weapon, but then can be a serious defensive weapon. And this is a big game changer for the U.S. Navy and U.S. Navy strategy, because, wow, what a thing. You now have a ship completely enclosed in iron. It's a completely different type of ship than anything that had come before, but one that was in some ways impervious to receiving incoming fire, or so they thought. So this changes the way people think about all this, that the U.S. Navy thinks about Confederate ironclads as a, as a major problem on the southern coast, but then also trying to think about how do the, does the Union Navy use ironclads in an offensive way. The USS Monitor had a few design flaws. The next uh, one in the line was called the USS Passaic, and the Passaic class of monitors are a big technological improvement, that one of the things they did was move the wheelhouse with the uh, USS Monitor, it sat on the deck just forward of the, uh, the turret uh, when you can't really see anything from there when you're trying to steer the ship. And that was a noted problem during the Battle of Hampton Roads. So they moved the wheelhouse to the very top of the turret. That way you could actually see out. They uh, also improved the ordnance that was involved. The ship was a little bigger so it could float a little better, a little more stable in the water. The U.S. Navy felt that these improvements were a big deal, and so therefore you could push these things out there uh, not only to fight off Confederate ironclads, but the Navy hoped it would be a way to charge into some of these open Confederate ports and close them down. So Samuel Francis DuPont, in January 1862, was tasked, or uh, rather January 1863, was tasked with using these in combat, with uh, using them to force open the port of Charleston and using them in a more offensive way 
on the South Atlantic blockading squadron. Samuel Francis DuPont was a little skeptical of this because he knew that they were small ships compared to regular Navy ships. But then also think back to the Battle of Port Royal where none of the Confederates had time to really train or learn their guns. By early 1863, they had. These guys knew what they were doing. They had heavy guns, had rifle guns, which could shoot further with more powerfully. They had time to pre-aim everything in harbors, so in a fixed position you can pre-aim everything, put up what's called aiming buoys in the harbor, so you know distances, which is an important part of shooting a cannon like that in the period. And so he had thought, well, our time has passed. If we were going to go charging in, we should have done it in 1861 and early 1862, and maybe not 1863. But I don't know what ironclads will do. I've never really used them, so let's try them out. Let's, let's use them a little bit in combat and see if they're going to be useful. So as he received ironclads, he put them into action against Fort McAllister in Georgia from January to March of 1863. So he thought, if I'm going to try to charge into Charleston Harbor, let me see if I can take an eight-gun Confederate fort first. So he sent in one Passaic-class monitor. I wasn't able to take the fort. He sent in two. Wasn't able to take the fort. He sent in up to seven, and they weren't able to subdue an eight-gun Confederate fort. So he got to thinking, this is not possibly going to be the magic bullet that the Navy Department thinks that it is. And part of his rationale on this is that there are some technological problems even with the Passaic class monitors. That one of the first is there's a slow rate of fire, that their turrets only hold two guns. So you can only fire so fast, and they can only elevate so far. So whenever you're sitting low in the water, you can't get the guns up high enough to be able to shoot at forts which are above you as you sit in the water. So this is a pretty big problem that you can't shoot enough to be able to take these forts out compared to how much they can shoot at you. The turrets themselves are also pretty vulnerable because they leak. There's not a good way to seal them onto the deck of the ship. So whenever they're underway, there's water always going across the top and there's water coming in. And also remember that wheelhouse that sat atop the turret. It's sitting on a center spindle and so if you have a shell that hits that wheelhouse, it bends a little bit and it pins the turret in place, so you can't turn the turret. So they had to add additional armor onto the wheelhouses to make sure that they didn't get bent and pin the turrets down and make these ships ineffective. And another important consideration is these weren't so-called blue water vessels. You couldn't just take them out to sea because they sit low in the water. You can't take it out into a rough ocean like the uh, image that you see at bottom. Uh, this is a Passaic class monitor fighting through a heavy sea that uh, these ships did not do well. They were considered brown water vessels, meaning that they're good for working in ports, inland waters, but not necessarily in the open sea. And the USS Monitor itself was even sunk in high seas, uh, even though it was being towed. It wasn't under its own power. So these ships are pretty vulnerable in a lot of ways. And he made that argument back to the Navy Department. The Navy Department really wanted to capture Charleston with an all-ironclad force. And Samuel Francis DuPont argued back that, uh, is it really necessary? You know, why do you want to take Charleston? Is it a political point or is it a strategic one? Because in his estimation, the blockade was effective, that they were cutting off the port of Charleston. There was no reason to really do it. So there's a bit of an argument starting in, in early spring of 1863 over whether or not this is going to be a good idea. Sorry, police vehicles going by outside. I wanted to make sure that cleared out so you could hear what I was saying. But he wanted to make sure this was a good idea before actually charging in to do it. So these are considerations to, to think of. He was finally ordered to make his attack on Charleston Harbor, and the Navy Department positively ordered him. He gave his misgivings. They argued it back and forth. He said, okay, I'll give it a try. So on April 7, 1863, he steamed in with nine ironclads to try to capture Charleston Harbor with an all-ironclad force with the U.S. Navy. Within two hours, he had to call the attack off, and because a lot of what he had argued actually came to pass, that during this battle, the uh, U.S. Navy scored somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 hits on Confederate forts. They, in turn, scored over 400 hits on his flotilla, and within about 15 minutes, seven of the nine ships of his flotilla had been put out of action that either had taken direct hits on his wheelhouses had been disabled in some way, had captured, had, they had had, their propellers had hit obstructions that were put across the channel. Even his own flagship, the uh, USS New Ironsides, unbeknownst to him, had been parked right over a 2,000-pound sea mine. 
uh, which he didn't realize at the time. Unfortunately for him, the Confederates couldn't get it to fire electrically. Um, but it was a not exactly the, the best situation to be going into. So he decided after two hours to call off the attack. The only ship that got close to a Confederate fort was the USS Weehawken, shown in the, uh, the image at top, which uh, got within a, a few hundred yards of Fort Sumter and got a few shots into it before having to retire. Pulling all of his ships out, he got a, all of his commanders together, had a council of war, and decided, in his words, rather than turn a defeat into a disaster, I decided to call off the attack. He figured there's no way we can go back in on April 8th and renew this attack because our ships had taken too much damage. We just, we just couldn't overwhelm the fire of the Confederate forts. So remember Robert Smalls. He had a distinction in this battle as well, that he was the pilot of the USS Keokuk during the Charleston attack. So he had the honor of helping lead one of the Navy ships into the attack. And uh, when the attack stalled, was able to sail the Keokuk out and around and, and make, yeah, get a little more forward in the battle line and try to make a more determined attack. The Keokuk was the only ironclad that was sunk during this battle. They were able to disengage, but it had taken so much damage it sank the next day. But Robert Smalls was given the distinction of helping carry out this attack by Samuel Francis DuPont uh, in honor of him sailing the planter out uh, the year before. So uh, these people come back around. When this battle failed, there had to be a scapegoat in somebody's eyes because this was a major thing. A lot of publicity went out about this battle, and there was a lot of arguments back and forth between Samuel Francis DuPont and the Navy Department, particularly between Gustavus Fox, who was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and Gideon Wells, who was the Secretary of the Navy. That uh, The arguments had to do with whether or not Samuel Francis DuPont carried out you know, the, the, the attack with enough vigor, whether he was... Uh, showing cowardice under fire as was the most extreme thing, or just he went in half-heartedly. And Samuel Francis DuPont argued back and forth, you know, you weren't here. You weren't the person on the ground. You don't know how these ships work. I've been trying them in combat since January. Here's all my arguments for why I think this was a bad idea. And his one fatal mistake in all this, or two fatal mistakes, the one really fatal mistake in all this, was saying to the Navy Department, if you think you can find someone who can do this better than me, send them down. And they took that, uh, used that as pretext for his resignation and relieved him of command of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron. And so the other mistake was to continue to pick this fight with the Navy Department. A lot of people told him, if you just leave this alone, it'll go away. You'll be given another command, no problem. Even his wife Sophie told him that, but he just wanted to prove the point so badly. He was replaced initially with Admiral Andrew Foote, shown here at left. But uh, Andrew Foote died on his way to the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, so his replacement ended up being John Dahlgren, that uh, he was a favorite of the Lincoln administration, and the Navy Department felt that he would be someone who would carry out attacks with more vigor than Samuel Francis DuPont could. So he relieved Samuel Francis DuPont of command in July of 1863. But before Samuel Francis DuPont left, he got to witness the capture of the Confederate ironclad Atlanta, by the USS Weehawken and USS Nahant in June of 1863. And this proved a point to him that uh, these ships were good for ship-on-ship -ship action, like the Battle of Hampton Roads, which is one of the things he had argued for, but terrible against forts. And so the uh, CSS Atlanta was considered a big menace, and so he sent the uh, two ironclads, Passaic-class ironclads, after it, and uh, they, this battle lasted less than 15 minutes. The, the uh, USS Weehawken fired two shots, and the battle was over that both shots hit in the casemate of Atlanta, and it killed so many people, stunned everyone inside. They ran the ship aground and struck their colors. The USS Nahan didn't get to fire a shot, and their crews were pretty upset about that. But again, this proved the point, the parting shot, so to speak, for Samuel Francis DuPont in his argument with the Navy Department. He, at that point, returned home to the Brandywine in July of 1863. The uh, photograph you see here is of Samuel Francis DuPont and Sophie, his wife, standing in the porch of their house, called uh, Upper Louvier, which is across the river from uh, the DuPont Powder Works. He uh, got hauled in front of a couple of congressional and Senate investigations during this period for uh, the conduct of the war. He himself wanted to carry on this fight and be vindicated. He didn't want to be called a coward, didn't want to be thought of as going in half-heartedly. So one of the things he did during this time was to hire this fellow, Xanthus Russell Smith, to uh, come to the Brandywine and help him out. Xantha Smith 
was on his staff and he was the commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, but was from the uh, Smith family of painters from Philadelphia. That Xantha Smith was in his own right a pretty good painter. So he did a lot of drawings, paintings for Samuel Francis DuPont, which are in our collections at Hagley. The uh, image I showed you of the attack on the CSS Atlanta by the Weehawk and the Nahan, Xantha Smith did that. He also did drawings like the one you see here, which is of uh, Confederate sea mines. He uh, did drawings of Confederate ironclads, of Confederate forts in Charleston Harbor to help visually make the point to the Navy Department in a really nice and artistic way about uh, why Samuel Francis DuPont was right in some of his arguments about how hard it was going to be to capture these places. Xantha Smith ended up going back in to the Navy serving with uh, David Farragut later in the war and went on to a career as a pretty important uh, painter of marinescapes and landscapes and a pretty important painter of Civil War and naval scenes. So if you come across Xanthus Russell Smith, that's probably where you've heard of him, but before he became a pretty famous artist, he was working for Samuel Francis DuPont to make these arguments with the Navy Department. And so Samuel Francis DuPont, in a lot of ways, uh, didn't win on this. He, in the court of public opinion, was still a, a pretty famous guy, but according to the Navy Department and the government, uh, was w lost out big. They didn't feel like his point was terribly valid. He was, though, partially vindicated because uh, John Dahlgren, who the Navy and the Lincoln administration thought would go charging in and capture Charleston, couldn't do it either, that for all of his aggressive tactics, he was not able to capture Charleston with an all-ironclad force, that it took uh, Sherman marching from Georgia, U.S. General William T. Sherman marching through Georgia to push on Charleston from the land and the Navy pushing from the sea. So it wasn't until February 1865 that you see Charleston captured. And once the U.S. Navy and Army got in, they said, oh, yeah, Samuel Francis DuPont was right. These forts were heavily fortified. They had pre-aimed everything. All these things, these factors that he argued for being there were actually there. So it wasn't just his imagination. Something to point out about this image is uh, under the arrow, that little blip out on the water, is actually the USS New Ironsides in action. This uh, image is in, a, in and of itself a pretty important one because it shows Civil War ironclads in action. This is of the USS New Ironsides bom or bombarding uh, Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. So a pretty important picture in and of itself. So that's one of the neat things I wanted to point out to you about this uh, before, before we moved on. So in the court of public opinion, Samuel Francis DuPont ended up staying a, a pretty important hero to the public because he had scored the first major victory. He had scored a bunch of victories. He was considered a, a pretty well-known guy throughout the United States. And uh, to that point, the uh, image it left is a checker or chessboard that shows the faces of prominent U.S. generals and Navy men and circled as none other than Samuel Francis DuPont. So he was able to make it onto a chess and checkerboard. And then you have uh, little prints like the one you see at right showing Union naval officers, some of the Union naval heroes. Uh, this was published in 1864, so this was well after being relieved of command and during his argument with the Navy Department, but Samuel Francis DuPont, who circled, shows up as one of the major Navy heroes along with David Farragut, which is at the top. They damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, David Farragut. So he still was considered a pretty important guy through the end of the war. He never received another major command. The only thing he ended up doing was evaluating uh, promotions and other kind of managerial duties with the U.S. Navy Department. Samuel Francis DuPont died unexpectedly in June 1865, and uh, he never really had a chance to rehabilitate his reputation or carry out to the fullest extent the arguments he wanted to with the Navy Department. So Sophie DuPont, his wife, carried on this argument in a big way. She wanted to rehabilitate her husband's reputation and see that he got the credit that was due him because he was in disgrace with a lot of people at the end of the American Civil War. She wrote to everyone he ever wrote to and got them to either send back his correspondence or copies of his correspondence and compiled it all in one place, which was pretty incredible that uh, she pulled all that together she herself didn't write anything, but she gave all these materials to this guy, Henry Algernon DuPont, who was himself a Civil War veteran. He was in Battery Beef, uh, 5th United States Artillery. He ended up uh, getting several honorary promotions for uh, doing well on the field during the Shenandoah Valley Campaign in 1864, and then later in the 1890s received the Congressional Medal of Honor 
So he was someone who was known as an important guy. Uh, stayed in the regular army. He was a West Point graduate, stayed in the regular army until 1874, then later became a U.S. senator from Delaware. But Sophie gave Henry A. DuPont all of the admiral's papers to do something with. So the first really biography of Admiral DuPont was written by Henry Algernon DuPont. He was considered, again, a pretty important thinker in the DuPont family, sort of de facto historian. And this collection, it's important to point out, too, that if you come to Hagley and look in the Admiral's collections, it consists of over 38,000 items. It's incredible how much is there, and it documents his career from 1815 all the way to his death and beyond. And that's due to Sophie DuPont gathering all this stuff together and putting it in the, the hands of Colonel DuPont, Henry Algernon DuPont. So uh, Henry Algernon DuPont also helped get uh, not only the biography together of Admiral DuPont, but also published selections of his Civil War papers, published selections of his Mexican War papers. So this kind of gets the ball rolling to a rehabilitation of the Admiral. Many of you that have been to Washington, D.C., have no doubt heard of DuPont Circle. And this is the thanks that Congress gave to Admiral DuPont in 1884. Notice it's nearly 20 years after the Civil War ended, so it took that long for Congress to officially vote thanks and vindicate Samuel Francis DuPont for his service. So again, if you've ever been to DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C., that's how DuPont Circle got its name. It's named after Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont. So remember the statue I showed you in the very beginning, it originally stood in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. And uh, you can tell by the photograph, if you've been to uh, DuPont Circle recently, it looks absolutely nothing like this. So there was a lot of change in D.C. between 1884 and now, um, a lot of changes to this, uh, this statue and monument as well. So where I'm going to leave you today, bringing this all full circle, I told you we were going to start with the monument and end with the monument. This monument's ending up in Rockford Park in Wilmington had to do with the uh, DuPont family. In uh, 1920, the family wanted to see a more uh, befitting monument to Admiral DuPont, and through people they knew in Congress, they were able to get appropriations and then also private donations. Appropriations and then a, uh, an official move from Congress to be able to get the monument replaced. So in 1920, they replaced the uh, statue with this fountain, which you see it right, which is currently what's in DuPont Circle in Washington. And at that point, that's when the uh, monument was moved from DuPont Circle to Rockford Park here in Wilmington. So we've taken you on a whirlwind, whirlwind trip of Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont's Civil War service, all the way from his beginning in 1815 through the Mexican War, through going to China, all the stuff that he did through the American Civil War. I realize there's a lot I didn't say, a lot I didn't touch on uh, for the purposes of being able to, to get through an hour's worth of material here for you today. But I hope I've given you a sense of who he was and, and why his career was important getting into the Civil War and a sense of why he was an important Civil War figure, although you may have never heard of him. A lot of folks have never heard of Samuel Francis DuPont the same way they have of a, a David Farragut, you know, people like that, or maybe John Warden, who was the first commander of the USS Monitor, some of these people that tend to be a little more famous. But um, I'll take a second here. If any of you have any questions that you want to type into the comments section. And while I wait a second to see if anything comes in, I'd like to encourage you to uh, check out our website, www.hagley.org where you can uh, get updates on what we have going on at Hagley, uh, some of the Hagley from Home initiatives which are there. So not only do you uh, get these live streams from me, but you, our education department's putting out great stuff for uh, kids that are uh, trying to do science and STEM projects from home, history projects, all sorts of things. We've got uh, lectures through our Hagley History Hangout that are there, uh, all, all sorts of good stuff from the Hagley from Home page. So I encourage you to uh, give that a look. And if you want to see other Civil War-related materials, head over to our digital archives, which is at digital.hagley.org. There is a separate Civil War collection where you can see uh, some pretty awesome photographs of Samuel Francis DuPont and the USS Wabash and other uh, Civil War scenes. There's also stuff about Henry A. DuPont, the DuPont Powder Works, other things that are there. Also, head over to our Facebook page. And also mine, Lucas R. Clawson, Hagley Historian, to catch up on other things that are happening 
short videos, other events and stuff that's going down at Hagley. So uh, please check all these out and uh, to see what we've got going on. Alrighty, well, I will wrap things up for us today. Thanks for joining me for another Live with the Hagley Historian. Uh, tune in next week, next Friday, 10 to 11 a.m., where we'll uh, get more into uh, some of the collections at Hagley and some of the history that you can do from it. If you've got any questions, feel free to type them into the uh, comments section after the live stream is done, or you can uh, go to our website. There's a, a standard form, askhagley at hagley.org, where you can... Uh, Type in questions, and they'll uh, cycle them over to me or uh, someone, who, uh, if it's uh, something that they can answer, they'll be happy to answer it for you. So uh, thanks again for joining. Everyone be safe out there, and we will see you soon.